you know, over an extended period of time, I was uh, involved in, in a number of huge attacks um, and we lost a lot of people. But as I came down to the roundabout, we like swung a left. There was a massive car bomb about 150 meters in front of us. It actually cracked one of our armored windows at the back. We kind of like shmag up and put makeup on and all that lot to make us kind of fit in a little bit. We were in two car moves across the whole of the country. And they lost about nine people in the West and got kidnapped. Nick, how are you, brother? How are we doing, Chris? Yeah, top dog, mate. Top dog. I've been for my little run this morning, so that always um, makes me feel special for the day. And, uh, yep. and you're taking lots of people running. I am, yeah, remotely online and also, uh, yeah, on the hills and fair runs and stuff like that as well, yeah. There's lots of uh, events coming up in there, so people are kind of getting back into it a little bit. Yeah. Let's get into all that because I love it. I'm also interested from a sort of coaching perspective, um, how you, you know, how do you get clients? How do you keep them? What sort of things are people looking for? Because um, ironically, I've just gone from being the commando coach to being the legends coach. Mm. I did that for a few reasons. Um, ah, I won't, won't go into that now, but um I'm just thinking about like audience perception um, and a few other things, but um, 23 SAS, that's something that comes up a lot on this show. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. We actually watch a lot of your posts. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. People are fascinated by it. A lot of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's, you hear a lot about the regular SAS. There's kind of no, no secrets there. Are there anymore? <laughs> It probably should be um, for the special air service, but I think everyone kind of knows the score. But coming up, doing it as, doing this as a civilian is that's no mean feat, is it not? No, and I know it's changed quite a lot over the years, especially since I left, which was officially in like two thousand and four. Uh, but what I noticed, kind of going back on what you said earlier on about elite outdoor fitness and you know what we offer, I think I kind of captured a little bit from the early days from when I was uh, in the military and then when I kind of went, that I left and then I trained to join 2-3 specifically. Um, I found that the, the training that was given to these young lads or whatever that were trying to join 2-3 or SBSR or, or even 2-2, et cetera, um, wasn't sufficient enough to get them through. And so the, you know, the, uh, the rate of failure, which is it's even higher now, to be fair, um, was there and you know and, and, and there was no need for it because I you know I was relatively well I was very fit and strong when I went for selection and it was a bit of a shocker to me when I went for selection because you know without sounding big-headed I kind of uh, was the fittest person I knew when I was in the military but then when I went on two three selection I found it so hard um, because I wasn't specifically hill fit I was probably more power fit than I was SF fit in that respect and there wasn't any guidance around it no to speak to you know, and uh, I think they're missing out on that. It happens to be actually that we're the go-to, uh, or I am specifically, because I'm the only one that does uh, personal training for SF now. Um, it, with regards to two one, two three, a little bit of SPS and uh, two two as well, um, and I'm the go-to place now for that. So we've kind of got like a hidden website where people can uh, get a business card off of certain locations, and uh, they'll flash it, and it comes up with a, a little bit of info, more info regarding myself what I've done, what selections I've done, because I've done a, a couple to just go up the tiers, like 2, 3 and HTR. Um, and yeah, and I think hopefully it, we, we've got 100% success rate of getting people in at the moment. So we're doing quite well in that respect. Yes, what, just enlighten us, what does HCR mean? It was like a, a higher contingency, like a reserve regiment um, that was supposed to bring 2, 1, 2, 3, uh, in line with 2, 2, so that we could work with them. Not do all the... Uh, um, some of the like, um, um, uh, you know, for example, uh, the black stuff, um, you know, dropping out the sky at 20,000 feet. Like we didn't do any of that, but uh, it allowed us to go on operations with 2 2. Uh, and just kind of suppose, because we were like the second tier, go up to maybe 1.5 tier, I suppose. And I'm not sure it even exists now. I think there was about 36 folks that went through it. It was in Africa. 
um, and you had to like do 4K now on the uh, hills, do the seer course, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so I was lucky enough to do that and it was a... Uh, Got you. We'll, co we'll come on to that because obviously everyone's always fascinated to know what, what does the regular SAS think of the reserves. Um, um, but tell us more then. So you actually train people that want to go on these kind of high power courses then, these high powered military courses. Yeah, Marines, power, French kind of commandos and uh, power, uh, uh, the legionnaires. Um, and yeah, UK SF as well. So we're kind of like, we're the unofficial go-to because obviously, you know, uh, there's a lot of hoops to jump through. I'm hoping that one day maybe we'll uh, be a bit more, um, you know, they'll take us on board a bit more so that it kind of becomes a bit more official. But uh, I think it, the, the process works. You know, I've done it myself. And uh, luckily for me, I did a PTI course when I was in the army. Um, I, I, you know, I did sports, nutrition, and sports science at university. Um, and so I've got a good background in that. And also... I'm absolutely passionate about it. And I'm not passionate about it at an elite level, although our company names Elite Outdoor Fitness. It's about getting those people, like we just discussed prior to this, actually, um, getting those people that don't know where to start or they come off it. Um, uh, because most people, they go in and out of fitness and out of training and um, they're bound in, they're bound out. And, and even later on in life, you know, they don't understand that they start to lose maybe a little bit of their speed, a little bit of their, um, you know, um, the, the, mus the muscular kind of body, they start to lose that a little bit. So you've got to start training a little bit differently than you would do if you were 18 or 19 years of age. And that runs in line with training people for the likes of SF because the age limit has gone up a lot in the last few years, but they're not getting, they're getting less people through because when you go for something like that, um, and this is only my opinion, uh, you need to want it and you need to need it in your life. You know, it, it's, it's not... It's not a passing course in the sense that you have to pass certain specific tests, although it is to a certain extent. Majority of it is there, you're, on a daily basis, you're failing most of the things that you do, but you need to continue on and keep pushing as hard as you can all the time. And so there's always that mindset of saying, I just need to keep driving forward, even though I'm feeling like I'm failing at most things that I'm doing, because that's, that's the tasks that are at hand. You know, they kind of, no matter how fit and strong you are, they bring everybody to this very low level of like capability uh, through tiredness and lack of sleep and the you know, exhaustive effect of the actual course itself. Um, and I suppose really um, you, if you've got a lot more in your life, like maybe family and children and, and maybe even a good job, um, they're all draws when you're in that hole to say, come on, that's your normal bloody life because it's a lot better. You know, we had like pilots in our courses that would, they were destined to pass because they were doing so well. Um, and they kind of sapped it halfway through and then and, and said, no, I, I don't want to continue. No, it's a given up course. A lot of people give up. And I think nowadays, because they're, they're, I think the age limit, I, I, you know, you might quote me on this, actually. I'm not sure because it's changed so much just in the two or three years with COVID and that. Um, you've got people that have got a little bit more in their life uh, than maybe a 19, 20, 21 year old that's, that's already served a, a three or four or five years in the military has. You know, when I went, I didn't, I fell out with my family a little bit, my mum and dad and my brother, and I, I didn't really had a lot of contact uh, with them. I, um, I was just training, I was on my own. Uh, I'd left the military specifically to train, I just kind of focused my mind on it. And so it was never an option for me to not complete that and finish it. So Yeah, of course. I always get a bit, like when people message me and, and, uh, so yeah, I want to join up, blah blah blah, and it's like, dude, you've got children. What? Don't you like them? <laughs> yeah. Do, do they do they want their dad killed in a foreign war zone or something? It, it's it, it. We are quite deluded in this country about what I think. What the military? I think we've, you know, we, the military's so embedded in our psyche in on this island through history that we. We live in a bit of psychosis isn't probably the right word, but I think people know what I mean if I say we're a bit deluded about what what the role of killing people is. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, for me, you know, I kind of talk for myself, it changed when I had a family. I was quite late coming, I was nearly close to 40 because I didn't just serve in SF, and which was, I think, a relatively short period of time, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but then that kind of allowed me to jump on and, and be relatively successful, if you want to call it that, at doing my job. Uh, 
in the right way when I went to Iraq, which was for about five years, and then Afghan for about six years afterwards. And um, yeah, and and I couldn't have done that with children. No, I take my heart off to some of the guys that I served with that did. But what I found, certainly with the Iraq and the Afghan thing, more than the SS thing, that quite a few of them actually came unstuck eventually a little, a little bit, especially in Iraq. There's a lot, there's a few of them that took their own lives, unfortunately, and there was a, a lot of them that kind of perished out there, unfortunately, as well. Um, but generally, um, I couldn't have done that. And like, I, you know, a little bit of a dit is uh, when I was uh, in Afghan with, uh, we, were, we were doing a joint operation out there with, uh, with the, the Hereford lads. And um, I think I, did I have a death? My, I think I had a death in the family. So I was out there or I was on due R and R or something like that. I was out there for a few months and then I came home, but I, I came home on my own, got to this herc and black and I, so we got like heli lifted out and then we went up to Bagram Air Base and then we got lifted out from there and it was all like dark stuff. And uh, I was on the back of this uh, um, uh, Herc, and I thought I was on my own because I was told that I was on it on my own. And uh, I saw somebody uh, at the back, so I, I went down, and it was one of the lads for another location. I said, "Oh, what's the script? What's the matter? How come you? How come you? Uh, you know, getting out of country?" And he said, "Oh, having a baby." And I went, "Oh, when he went now, she, she's she's having it right now." And he spent a week at home and he flew him back because I went. I spent about eight eight days, seven or eight days, and I came back and he was on the same flight as me, come back in again. And I think we did six or nine months after that. And when I, you know, my little one's only five now, but um, I was like a, a stay-at-home dad because I was actually um, bringing Elite Outdoor Fitness together when I finished the Middle East. And that's when I kind of met my wife and I had uh, my little girl. And I remember thinking after about six or seven months of like looking after and spending all that extra quality like dad time with her, how difficult it must be for the blokes that are serving six months tours when they've had a baby and they come home and they're six months old. That gift of like spending that time with your little one, do you know what I mean? And I know that there's a compromise and I get that. And I think it's harder and harder for people that are joining the military now because the age limits are going up for, the, for those specific reasons. Yeah, see, I think of it the other way. I think how sad is it for that kid that the most important time, the first year of your life is when bonding is, is yeah, so exactly. incredibly important and it will it will make or break you as an adult. Yeah, that, that I, year, I have done, yeah, I couldn't have done without that. I, I needed it in my life to uh, to have the, you know, to, I don't spend any time away. We do a couple of expeditions a year with uh, Trident Adventure, which is like our sister company to a certain extent. So on the lads that I used to serve with, we go to Morocco, we go to like um, the Arctic, Sweden, Norway, stuff like that. And um, one of those is 10 days. I think he's drawing it a bit short for eight days. But it's all, I find that hard being away from a family. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, that's all like, that was my life before. And, uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing. You know, I know what's important. But what I will say is, is going away for one day, whether I'm working on an exercise, not an exercise, but an event or whatever somewhere, or I'm doing an event for two or three or four days. It's quite nice as well because it gives it, it it brings you back in and gives you more perspective on your life and uh, an appreciation of things that you've got at home. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it, though? In that, you know, in nine months, that's that's your kid saying dada for the first time, or, or obviously in this case, not. That's your kid walking for the first time. That's you taking your kid to the swimming baths for the first time. Yeah, yeah exactly. That's, that's you changing God knows how many nappies, which might sound a bit bizarre but that's a bonding thing with your son and it's you know yeah, yeah I always true. remind always remind my boy I was the first one to change your nappy son <laughs> <laughs> all the nurses in the hospital were a bit like really <laughs> um but yeah it, it, it's interesting the kids the service kids just get well overlooked and it's starting to really it, it's starting to be appreciated now amongst the charities that that um you know there's damage being being done there but then i think the services are going to struggle now it just seems that people don't want to you know join up anymore in the way that they used to and now that they're uh, let's just say forcing them to have procedures especially experimental ones it's i'm getting people email me all the time like what do i do i say well what, what, what do you think you do you, you know, it's, <laughs> if you die next week, what, what, you know, do you, do you think the MOD care about, care about that? that you, you, you are literally just a number. And 
Um, I think, uh, judging by what I see online, it just it it doesn't seem to be the thing these days that young men go, oh yeah, I'll join the military. I mean, some some do, and I don't really know <laughs> young women, so I can't can't mm. comment there. But um, but then again, we also kind of live in bubbles, don't we, or echo chambers? Because you train people elitely, and I talk about my military days on the podcast, so I get to speak to a lot of young men. I've coached four guys through Limston now, or at least you know. Mm. an hour or two on the phone when they were really struggling and and bang they all they all got out the remedial troop and got their green green lids and that's what it's about isn't it it's about i I didn't have that you know i i started my journey in the RAF, and i bloody hated it and i couldn't wait to get out i didn't really leave school with any qualifications i spent that year where i was trying to join up um getting qualifications at college maths english and science Mm. Uh, because I didn't leave, leave with anything. And so I kind of joined the military, was on the ground crews with the helicopter squadrons, and I didn't enjoy it at all because I wanted something different. But I was brought up in a little village, and I, I didn't know what was out there. And because uh, and, a couple of family members were in, in, the, uh, in the RAF and doing cooler jobs and all like UK mountains and all that lot, and on the Hercs, I kind of thought, yeah, okay, that's the route, and then I'll just see where I go from there. And I suppose that's what I did. But what I found was, from, just for myself, there was nobody to speak to. There was no people to get that bit of information on whether you want to get a little bit fitter. I wanted to, do, you know, I wanted to get into triathlons, which I did, and mm. uh, I was fortunate enough to win a couple actually in Ireland specifically. Um, and, and then I started training people in, in, in that regard, and then eventually I went SF myself, and it was a shocker for me because. I thought I was fit as a fiddle, and I seemed to do very well on all the bases because I was lucky. I went kind of. Um, I went with the squadrons all over the country and around the world a little bit. And as soon as I rocked up on a camp, I'd go, wait, where's the armor lads? Is there any powers here, any Marines, any this, doing there, any circuit training sessions on, any like combat fitness tests, CFTs going on at this time. And I was all amongst it because I just was so competitive and I just wanted to get a burger on the back and prove myself. And, um, and then when I went to SF, I kind of, um, because I didn't have any specific guidance of what socks to wear or what boots to wear or, how oh, bad T-shirts run when, we, when they're cotton, not synthetic and with a bergen on and, and, and the smaller things. But now that's, that's where the majority of my time is specifically for the SF people. And it's about saying, look, you know, because most people that come to me, um, as long as they're the right age and they haven't got any underlying conditions um, and their body composition is such that they allow them to gain the fitness and the momentum to carry them through the courses, you know, over an extended period of time, I'm pretty confident that I get most people through because uh, because it's like anything in life. I mean, I know we discussed it earlier very briefly. Um, it doesn't have to be hard. You know, when you're doing those, what we would call very demanding sessions of running, I don't know, 20, 30 miles, you build up to that so that it's only as hard as your first week that you ran your four mile run it because it's, a, it's, it's building up to that nice and gently. And, uh, and I think that's really important. It's about giving the people the confidence to say, look, you know, whether it's SF or whether it's like like a, a lot of my people, and we do quite well at this one, you know, have heart conditions or they're struggling, they're coming back from cancer and they're in remission or they've had hip replacements or they're very overweight. It's about giving them the confidence to, to give them a program and having that 20, you know, four or seven communication with somebody that can say, look, yeah, it's just quite normal for you to feel like this. You know, it's quite normal for you to feel at this stage after training for six weeks to feel a little bit overwhelmed because you need to have a bit of a deload. You need to let all those chemicals get a bit more balanced because you've been over your own yourself and you get a bit tired. So let's just have a deload for a couple of weeks and get back into it. You know, most people, they get that wrong. And that's why they're in and out of fitness. You know, what we do is, um, or what I do now with people, uh, whether it's SF or not, you just give them a bit more balance over an extended period of time and make it part of their life. Our retention with Elite Outdoor Fitness is superb, actually. If anybody comes to us and leaves, it's because it's actually not for them. But most people, if they leave, they come back three or four months later and then they stay with us. And uh, we don't really lose anybody, actually. And from the original group of about 140 people that we had, like two or three years ago, most of them are still with us, in fact. And the average age, I would probably say, is is 40 to 50. Um, and, that, and the, the elitism out of it, or elite outdoor fitness, and I probably should change the name of it, but you know, it's, it's there now. Um, 
it's only there for people that want to maybe push themselves and just do something a little bit different. And for most people, actually just going and competing in like, I don't know, Paris 10 or, or actually finishing the, uh, the Avalanche endurance events, uh, fan dance with a bit of weight on or even clean fatigue. You know, that, that in itself is a, a huge accomplishment. And, that, and that's, where we're, that's, where, that's what we do. You know, that's, where, that's, I think, where we're, what we're good at. Does your name then um, put people off? I mean, let's just take some stereotypical example. Maybe you're a middle-aged woman, or I say middle-aged, you know, a woman over, I don't know, 35. God, I'm just, I'm already going to get in trouble here, aren't I? But are you carrying a bit, yeah. of, carrying a bit of timber? You, you realise, you know, only you can make changes in your life. Do I, I would think, when you see a name like Elite Outdoor Fitness and it's run by a military guy, they'd go, "Oh, actually, I'll 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 go and do the Pilates thing." Yeah. It, it has that. I mean, just again going back is. So I was always the commando coach, but I'll be honest. I'm I'm just trying to get away from all things military because the older you get, the more. I find the more negativity there is trying to, when you've got one foot in that. Yep. Yeah. And I can relate to that. I I deal with lots of veterans on a daily, daily basis. And for me, life's all about having a high vibration, high energy, Mm -hmm. having people around that you can talk to that inspire you, that fucking believe in you and love you, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, push you on and, and you can have, uh, intelligent conversations about the universe and you know this sort of stuff and well our, our company is exactly that it's transparent and it's authentic and it's quality people that um that want to be more positive and they want to bring about more balance in their life and you're right elite outdoor fitness i should have changed it and a couple of mates said you need to change that and, and i suppose at the time you know, it's one of them it's now kind of forged itself as a name a popular name you know taking away the fact that 95% of all our people are these people that need a bit of balance and they need a bit of motivation to allow them to just get a little bit more active, not even fitter, just getting out there and being active and getting away from like working at home all day and going, where do I start? Um, but apart from that, you know, we've won majority of the, uh, all the big events out there, especially with weight, Paris 10, Commander Shuffle. We've got course records and uh, like fan dance and all the race series and then joints. We're doing well. And it's only because... I think you, you just touched on a point there, which was um, we've, tr- we've tried quite a lot, actually, and we need, probably need a, a little bit more exposure. Uh, but I quite, I quite like the fact that we're growing, we're getting bigger, but it's at a manageable pace because I like to speak to every single person that's with Elite Outdoor Fitness. I pretty much spoke to for like an hour or two, and I do quite often as well uh, because I'm always here for them because I think that's really important, you know, and that's pretty much probably 50% of my job is, is uh, engaging with people and kind of working out what their strengths and weaknesses are. You know, why are you coming off your fitness? What, what, you know, why are you getting tired all the time? You know, and just trying to find, like you said before, it's a little bit like life coaching in actual fact, uh, rather than a personal trainer. Uh, but the majority of the people that come to us, which is um, a negative for us, is a lot of it is, is online. And it's uh, linking up with people like once or twice or three times a month and taking them out on the hill or teaching them how to navigate or if, if that's what they want to do or putting up a basho or how to kind of not feel vulnerable when it's when you're tired and you're cold and you're out in the elements for example and things like that but the majority of the time they're expected at home to look at a program speak to me on the phone or speak to us online because our programs are like in groups so they can chat to people and they can see everybody's results online and things like that so they can help that motivation it's actually quite difficult because they've just got to go out there and do it themselves. And you can tell somebody. Luckily for me, when I started to kind of um, think about the concept of elite outdoor fitness, I was working in the Middle East. And I had a relatively, I wouldn't say easy job, but it was, a, it was less on the ground. And it, I was a country manager. So I was a little bit more office bound in a compound. And I had a bit more time to kind of plan my exit strategy from Afghanistan. And uh, what I found was that uh, people needed to be motivated and they needed to be, I, I need to sit down and I need to look at their whole life and say, how can I keep this person motivated? How can I get them to go out three or four times a week and do some exercise? 
or, or to progress in, the, in their kind of fitness. And, and what do people need? And luckily for us, I think we've got that balance right. And you're right that it scares a few people off at Elite Outdoor Fitness, but, and, and, and we're going to be looking at that, to be fair. I'm only, uh, don't get... Don't get me wrong, mate. I'm not. I'm not in any way criticizing. I'm. Mo- I'm more asking because I'm. I'm just interested for my it's own. True, yeah, it is true. Yeah. You know, I'm interested for my own. Like I say, I was the commander coach, but I never. I wouldn't want people to think if they come to me for coaching that I'm going to put them through any kind of mental kind of physical training. endurance <laughs> course because it's not what I am and it's not what I do and it's not what I think. You know, for me exercise is about mental health mm. and so it can be as short as a, mar- a mile run around the block which is that was my normal i did that for years I, the only reason i put it up is i become so fit doing it yeah it wasn't worth going out of the house because i was already back home again so mm. now i put it up to three miles and with the you know if the marathon of the sands people sort their life out and stop insisting people have uh experimental uh, medical procedures then hopefully i'll be back on that in march but i thought running a, across the sahara desert i should maybe yeah i might i might go for it is what i'm trying to say and try and try and get as fit as i can and really see how i can get on with it um mm-hmm. but with the name thing nick you know it's more that um I think with a legends coach, it's more that I coach legends. I coach everyone to be a legend and understand that we all have a legend inside us Mm. and it's just a choice. So I thought it was more user friendly. If you're making money doing what you're doing, then I'd say don't don't change because you're probably getting a few. I don't know. Yeah, well, we we are. We're changing people's lives and it's just. I found that it's quite, it works quite well in the sense that the people that do come with us, they've got a bit of motivation, they've got a bit of momentum to change their lives from the offset if they do come to us at the moment. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing because you almost need that a little bit because it is so, you know, everything's remote. If you have a personal trainer was in the Middle East, I used to sit with engineers and I used to train like 20 or 30 people all the time because I was in a big compound on a, on a military base. And uh, I ended up doing it for the military as well. And that was easy to do because you can look at somebody and say, look, you look at your form or you can look at somebody's body composition and say, look, you maybe need to present the uh, speed sessions into your program a little bit more gently because you're a big lad and you put a lot of pressure on your ankles, your hips, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy to do like that. And doing it remotely is a lot different. And so having people that have got that extra drive and motivation because they're not scared and put off by elite outdoor fitness, it's kind of worked to our advantage, so I'm kind of happy with that. And also, same like you said there, I try to steer away from the military aspect of it a little bit because I, I suppose to an extent, I wasn't being SF and that. I wasn't comfortable with it and I didn't want to be that person that was like, I find it really difficult to sell myself um, and, and to sell that part of it as well. But I've got a great team of people around me now within the Elite Outdoor Fitness that have shown me uh, a platform that we use really that kind of... Um, uh, collects data and, and not just that but gives us an overall idea of what works mm. and and do you know what people people buy in if you want to call that uh, call it that buy into the fact that maybe people some people that be in the military or specifically F- sf and elite forces just have that extra bit of whatever if you want to call it that where they can you know uh, have a bit of confidence moving forward have a bit more motivation or be able to dig a little bit deeper because that stuff isn't specifically for certain individuals that have done those courses it's for anybody it's just you need to know how to tap into that a little bit and actually understand that you can gently and progressively tap into that type of uh, those types of areas so that you can gain more if for example if you're going to do the marathons or something or if you want to do your first 10 mile run or whatever you don't need to be training um ridiculously hard and beasting yourself like the military say to achieve those dizzying heights of like uh, greatness, if you want to call it that for each individual. Yes. I guess this thing about jumping off the wagon is this, again, this is goes back to what I'm saying about mental health. If you run for mental health, then you have to, you, you want to run every day. We're not, well, yeah, you do. Because if, when you don't, 
you don't feel so bloody great about your life. Mm. Um, whereas the old me was like going down the gym for bodybuilding was about what I looked like. And it's, it's, it was, I'm not going to knock it. You know, we've all, we've all done silly things in our life, but when I look back at it, I mean, it's just so silly. Like going to a gym just so you can, your muscles get bigger. It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff. I, I enjoyed that period in my life, but it, it did get a bit out of hand. Those blokes just do chest, biceps and abs. They don't even, when they walk out, their back's like that. And you can't even see a muscle group in it. <laughs> it's just that now my whole psyche is different. Now I want my body in tune with my mind. Hmm. You know, I want my body in tune with my mind. And now I'd rather be nine and a half stone and be able to run out, the, run like the wind. Yep. Then I would be 15 stone and just sort of look a bit silly in the mirror. Um, so, um, but I think that people, when they have trouble motivating, them, motivating themselves for uh, getting out and getting, you know, smashing the fitness or even just having fun with it, I think it's because they haven't made that journey across to the spiritual side. It, it's, to them, it's all still about like physical, you know, can I beast myself? Yeah. Da, 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 da. Most people that we train, they do too much. They do too much too quick in actual fact. And um, if you look at the science behind it, whether you like it or not, what essentially happens if you progress quite hard, because normally if you're coming back into training, let's say when you're in your 20s or 30s or 40s, you're not the same as you were when you were 18, but your muscles will remember. You've got a bit of muscle memory there. So your fitness and the way that you can project yourself forward is going to be there and that will grow quite quick. But it's the other smaller things like the little niggles and your, you know, the little injuries and niggles that you can have all the strains or the overwhelming feeling that you might get after four or five or six weeks because your body will progress and it'll progress quite, quite quickly. But over an extended period of time, and what's happened during that time is the chemicals and the balancing kind of chemicals and hormones in your body are going to start increasing, increasing to allow you to, um, to perform more efficiently and recover quicker and build muscle and tendons and ligaments and things like that and strengthen things up, you know, like testosterone and like a uh, human growth hormone to, to name like two of them. But what happens is over an extended period of time is you get so tired because they're increasing too much is that all those chemicals start to drop off. And then that's when people have a tendency over a period of year to offer on, off and on their training like that a little bit. Whereas if they just pull themselves back, the journey I find, is better because everything's manageable then, isn't it? It's rather than going out and beating yourself because unfortunately that's how the military used to be. And I, if you look at the military now, and I'm, I am out the loop a little bit uh, because I'm obviously not in on one of the training teams, but I think it's a bit more science backed now when you go on these courses and they've got people that have actually gone and done a little bit, a few more other courses to allow them to correctly train people appropriately for what they want to do. Let's say a 30 week commander course. Goodness me, you even told me about your epic uh, uh, tri triathlon at Ironman. Um, 30 days, you can achieve so much, especially when you're at that age. And if it's done more gradual, it, it's going to be uh, an impressive result at the end, isn't it? And you're going to more likely get more people that finish that one past that commander course rather than just beasting people for 30 days. Although I would say for the units such as the commander course, the powers, and, and, and even the military to a certain extent, those elements of beasting sessions are designed for something a little bit different, aren't they? To put that kind of mental thing there, the taxing that you have when you haven't got anything left in the tank, stuff like that. So there is a place for that, but I certainly don't think there's a place for it in for people that are starting their fitness journey. You want them to say, look, you want to start in January, you want to be still training in December and feeling good about yourself. And when people do fitness, and you touched on it earlier on, let's say they have um, a few bits and bobs going on with mental health, for example, if they incorporate the right level, not too much, not too little, the right level of uh, fitness, if you want to call it that, uh, and maybe hitting a few components of physical fitness more so than most, uh, and, and I don't know, kind of a multidisciplined approach trend, which is what we do, you find that you're more balanced and you're more balanced when it comes to your family, uh, stressors at home, uh, dealing in and money issues, work, you know, normal life stuff. Uh, you find that you're more balanced and more capable to kind of take a step back and have a look at it. Because that is all that I've ever done in my life. You know, people said, you know, when we go to the, 
uh, when I was in the Middle East and we were in like, you know, ambushes and stuff like that, that they, um, they learned from me and the, well, the way that I dealt with some of those as a team leader. But I certainly didn't just start dealing with it like that. It was a learning process. And, it was, and that stemmed from the way that I trained quite a lot and making sure that I was able to tax myself and also be able to have a take, take a step back sometimes um, when I was in stressful situations because I, I had the kind of the balance, the hormonal balance to allow me to do that. And I think fitness plays a huge role in that. Whether you're working in the Middle East or whether you're doing something stressful, you can put it into your everyday life and it will make you a more balanced person. And when your kids are doing your head and the, the wife's going or the husband's going on at you, you'll just be more balanced and more able to... Um, to uh, have a bit more perspective on on the situation, and and rather than uh, overwhelming yourself and and a bit of a chemical imbalance, because that's all that it is, isn't it? Yes. And let, so let's talk about the Middle East. You you mentioned that you've had colleagues commit suicide. <clears throat> Can you tell us a bit more about that? Because this is obviously a a problem, isn't it? Is this problematic of of former forces? Um, yeah, and I suppose it was. Yeah, a, a lot of the lads that was in the forces with both RAF and uh, you know, less in the SF world actually. We've had a we've had a couple, unfortunately, but uh, uh, we've had a couple that have stemmed from them putting themselves in situations that have been quite harsh. Uh, like there was a drown, there was a drowning, and things like that, and, and they were unable to save them uh, because of the types of people that they were. They put themselves out there, were unable to achieve a successful outcome. And it played on their minds for an extended period of time and at least at their lives. So that was very unfortunate. But I think that the drinking and the addictive culture of being in the military, um, for, for a lot of people, that, that, that plays a large part in, in uh, or played a large part in maybe the, the, the outcome of, of committing suicide. Um, you know, and I think, I think the military hopefully has, has changed quite a bit, actually, like Sam, a little bit out of the loop, but maybe... Maybe that's got a lot better, but certainly when I was in, it was a drinking culture. Um, it was a, having, always having something there to kind of shock your system, shock your body, and it almost if you weren't part of that culture, you were a little bit of an outcast, weren't you? Yeah, this I can hear a bit of a rumble. It sounds like wind, is it? Yeah, it's the, we've got a storm outside. It's been hammering down as well. So that's uh, okay, it is. It looks really beautiful where you are. <laughs> what, what, without That's obviously right. don't give us your address but what part of the world is that like Wales mid Wales yeah uh, in, in the months nowhere basically <laughs> nice and quiet yeah we got some beautiful landscape on this island haven't we yeah and the one next to us I should say before everyone writes in to complain <laughs> um, yes yes um, did you know anybody sort of closely or were they just acquaintances these no all, all close all good mates yeah and it's surprising i think well i think it, it's worse in males and possibly is in, in 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 females and i don't quote me on that but you know my understanding is uh i think that women and i see this in elite outdoor fitness we've got a lot of women and they just seem to be better at it they seem to be more balanced and more capable of progressing gently blokes are a little bit more gung-ho um and also, certainly when I was working away, I worked with females and males, certainly in the Middle East uh, and in the military. Uh, and I just found that there was certainly a higher way. I haven't got any female friends that did that, uh, but I have male friends. And I just think that, I think maybe ego it, it plays a bit of a part uh, because when it, when it happened, I was unaware that it was even close to that. And I think I'm quite a transparent and open person. And I'd like to think that. And I think I brought that, I brought that part into elite outdoor fitness. And I think that's why partly it's successful as well, because I think I'm really approachable. I'm open. I don't have, I don't really, I don't really have much of an ego in that respect. I'm more than happy to speak to people, more than happy to get upset about my past bits and bobs that have gone on. I don't have a problem with that. I just think that quite a lot of guys, especially the, the lads that unfortunately came a little bit unstuck, they weren't open as much to kind of like maybe going and sitting down with a mate and saying, look, do you know what? I'm really struggling at the moment or this has happened at home and I'm, I feel like I'm really getting overwhelmed or I'm taking too many steroids because that was a big thing out there as well or I'm drinking too much or whatever. You know, it was always swept under the carpet. Oh, no, everything's fine. Yeah, everything's great because it was a gung-ho job as well. And, and I think that all kind of fed into this um, 
into the system and, and, and people kind of work in the system going out and doing these jobs and it's all kind of very volatile and very violent and and, uh, and and difficult to control that kind of that aggression that's needed on the ground if you can call it that and then when they go home maybe they're acting a little bit differently and maybe uh, the response from their family is a little bit different and I think over periods of like time over years it didn't play well with their mental health and uh, hence you know uh, the outcome I suppose to a certain extent yeah were the were the guys committing suicide in the middle east or was this like on leave is was there a, a sort is there a pattern to this kind of thing yeah a few of them did it when they went home um and a few of them did it when they were out there as well yeah just in the, in like the bashes and that and pistols and yeah there was a lot that went out there and it was um to be honest with you, it was quite a bit of a fuzzy time, especially like 2003 at the end of the war. We went in and we were kind of like, they were flipping flat packing the whole of Baghdad and we went in like we were there within three days. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a harsh time um, and it kind of just thrown in there and the military kind of set up certain bases and we were just out on the ground, you know, um, and just never got to have a breather from it. You know, I was doing 12 month tours at one point. I think I did a six month tour and I came in for like a week and a half, two weeks. And then I went straight out there and did nine months and 12 months and 12 months and 12 months. And, and so you just, I just didn't get a, you know, nobody was getting a break. And I think you have to be quite a unique individual to, to be able to cope with the stresses there. Uh, and I think it worked better for people that were like happy in their own minds and that were happy to say, Do you know what, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit. Maybe I should take the neck for a week at home or, or whatever because I think that was really important. And most people struggled with that and didn't, and, and didn't get that balance right. Yes. So, Nick, you must have seen quite some action then over the years. Yeah, I spoke more so as a civilian working on the, on the contractor side, actually. Yeah, you know, um, as soon as I got into country, we went into, I think we went into Jordan initially, yeah, so... It was, uh, I can't remember what the border crossing was called, but it was pretty much Baghdad, Fallujah, Ramadi, and then the border is about 150 miles away. We came in there and we were in there like, uh, pick, got picked up a truck, no weapons, but I knew a guy um, that was in country already and I'd liaise with him and he kind of just chucked me a Tarek pistol. So I put that down my pants and that's all I had. And uh, we got involved in a massive RTA just before Ramadi and I got out. I was a trauma medic at that. I'd been an SF trauma medic, so I kind of got out of the ground and started looking after this guy that was quite badly injured, actually, uh, because they piled into this uh, vehicle that had just done the, like a 45-degree a, uh, turn in, in like a four-ton of vehicle, and he was only like about nine or ten years old that was driving it. And um, I got out, and your man said, get back in the car, we're going. I said, you can't leave me in. He always co he called it after that, the, the three-point ball, like they'll, um, you're out of the car, they clock you, you're dead. And it was spot on because probably within about two and a half minutes, there was a couple of uh, PKMs, which are like large machine guns, like a GPMG that you would you'd know. Uh, and there was a couple of PKMs that opened up from a building and then a, a couple of guys that were like cutting across, doing a flipping towards us um, in uh, like a fire manoeuvre, essentially. And uh, we were back in the vehicle, we were gone and the locals unfortunately had to sort themselves out. But uh, it was a good... It was a good thing to happen because it was, I, I'd only been in country probably about an hour and a half, two hours. And it just gave me all I needed. It kind of like, do you know what I mean? It reset me to say, right, okay, I know where I'm at now. Um, yeah, very quickly, I kind of, um, I had a death in the family. So after about one month, so it must've been December um, 2003. And so everything was trying to start to settle with the militia, ISIS, I suppose that you'd call them now, were there um, and they were trying to organize themselves and they were parts of all the the, the um, services or the police and government services and military if you want to call it that security that were within Iraq they were trying to you know there was probably a, it was very integrated with the militia um, and I had a death in the family and you know they were like 1.5 million pound contracts so they couldn't just get like a couple of vehicles and, and take me to the border so I ended up getting a taxi um, all the way from Baghdad to the Jordanian border. And when I got to the border, they flipping, they took me and they took me down into this cell and like uh, a bit of harsh, harsh kind of, uh, harsh kind of uh, routine there. Um, and they opened me for about three and a half hours and I was lucky to get out of that actually in hindsight. And I started to realise that over a period of time. 
that uh, it wasn't going too well for me. And I ended up having to flash my ID card that I had from the British Army. Um, and they, they released me. This Sorry, this was where? In which town? It was on the border of Iraq and Jordan. Right. But and I was on the Iraq side. Ah, uh, okay. When I approached and got out of the taxi and I tried to get my way through, they just, two blokes came when I was at the, well, it wasn't an office, it's like a desk where you just look, you have to show your passport to get through. They just grabbed me and pulled my hands behind my back. And before I knew it, I was down some, some steps into like a dark dungeon area. They launched me on the floor at the bottom of the steps, just so I spanked in as a bit of a harsh kind of routine to give me a bit of shock tactic. And then they held me there and they just questioned me on everything. And I didn't give much away at the beginning and I was quite honest and open because there wasn't really anything to, mm-hmm. to um, hide. But at the same time, I didn't really want to say that was with the security company or anything. So I kind of had a bit of a... And then eventually, I actually took the, um, the idea to flash my ID. And I thought, well, okay, this is the last chance to lose. I showed my British Army ID and said, look, there's probably an eye in the sky already because I was supposed to cross the border like two hours ago. Um, there's going to be a British call sign that are undercover on the other side waiting for me and they just they just released me straight away and I, I was through and I ended up getting into like a fixer's car that had been waiting for me on the other side and then we, we made it back into Jordan and luckily when I came back about five or six days later um, that there was a team waiting for me because they, I'd obviously given them a sick weapon what had happened and then from then when I got back into country yeah it was just pretty much hell on earth for about four and a half well two and a half years specifically but four and a half overall yeah in what respect? Just being hunted on the ground. Yeah. No top cover. You know, there was other companies out there that had a bit of top cover and stuff like that. But essentially, you're like a two-man at the beginning. We were low profile. We would kind of like shmag up and put makeup on all that lot to make us kind of fit in a little bit. We were in two-car moves across the whole of the country. We were stopping over in like military bases like Scania and stuff like that. Uh, and refueling and, and they'd give us free food and we'd go to the defect and we'd sign in with our locals. But Pretty, pretty harsh, you know. The ambushes they would set up, as soon as you left the location, they'd be on the radios and the telephones, and the kids would as well, to say, these are the cars, this is the colour of them. Um, they would, you'd get stuck in traffic, they'd come around your cars, they'd look how many magazines you got, how many weapons, what equipment you got, and then they forward it on. So you're always constantly trying to manoeuvre around them and, and kind of evade them. And, you know, over an extended period of time, I was uh, involved in, in a number of huge attacks. Um, and we lost a lot of people, you know. How you, you, were in a... Nick, Nick, you need to explain this for us, because we, for those of us that haven't been in that situation, you're making it like really blasé. What, what, how do you mean you lost people? Like, are you seeing people shot dead? Are you trying to, are you fighting for your life? Are you, are you? Yeah, so, so what, normally an ambush would uh, involve, they're quite complex ambushes. And obviously an ambush is a, is a killing zone. It's designed to kill everything that's in there. Yeah. And they were starting to perfect this over that period of time. Um, and they would set up a roadside bomb, a car bomb, or just fire in from one side. And they would even have firing from both sides. They're all almost firing in onto each other, but you'd be there. So maybe you would have two or three vehicles, because as we progress through that two to three to four year phase of Iraq, we would have more vehicles because we started to lose vehicles. And then you would have to nick other vehicles. But when a car bomb goes off or when a a suicide attack happens or whether there's like a, um, a, a charge that's set in the road um, of any kind, because there's so many, it will take a vehicle out and that vehicle will end up stopping probably 150 metres down the road. So then you will go to an, into a bit of a tactical kind of formation mm. to do your best to get those people out of that vehicle. And normally there will be fatalities in, in those cars. Yes, so you'd probably be engaged in, the contact, you know, in a contact for like maybe anywhere between Ten, five or ten minutes up to about 35 40 on some of the situations that we were in we had a number of situations for example we had four vehicles and we lost three of them and we all ended up in one vehicle and getting out there leaving a couple of people behind potentially that's that's that was kind of the weekly norm out there in Iraq so they they were dead bodies you left behind yes I was very lucky uh, because I was working in a two I was a um, senior TL of two teams at one point um, and luckily for me for my entire time in Iraq I only lost one person which happened just to be my best mate and he was in in our car with me but um, we were we did quite well and the reason for that I think is probably predominantly the, the training that I implemented into my specific teams 
um, and also uh, the the um, the interaction uh, with the local national staff that used to work with us, because I think that was really important as well. And I got that balance right within our team, and they saved my life on a number of occasions, and vice versa. Whereas other teams didn't get that a little bit, and they left folks behind, they left people. Um, very vulnerable. The locals didn't look after the expats and the expats didn't look after the locals. So having that kind of camaraderie that you'd have in the military between the local nationals and the PSD staff, I think were really important. And so we kind of got that right. Mm. What, what company were you with there? I was with a company called uh, Heart Group. And Heart Group pretty much took on all of the jobs that nobody else wanted. And so on quite a few occasions, we uh, had contracts that were given to a security company. They would subcontract to another security company and they would subcontract to, to us. We were sub-subcontracted mm-hmm. and they would go out. Um, we did uh, at the beginning a lot of uh, low-profile stuff of taking engineers and military personnel around to different locations. And we were kind of all shamagged up. That was, that was good for a start. But what you find out there with like, let's say Sada City and Fallujah and Ramadi, as they pop the vehicles, as you approach them, the outskirts of the city, they recognise that they're not local vehicles. They know the local vehicles, and so they're on you straight away. We had other call signs eventually after a period of time, like Olive and Armour Group and, and all this kind of stuff. And there was a number of incidents as well where, you know, they came unstuck and we had to go back. I'll give you an example of that. I came out, we, we came out the Assassin's Gate, and it's called the Assassin's Gate because it got like, demolished about six times and then rebuilt with massive truck bombs and you'd come straight out turn right over the assassin's bridge and you'd come down to like a little roundabout and you'd have to come swing round and get into palestine i think it was in the sheraton hotels which where all the you know, the news presenters were and things like that it's quite a good secure location and to a certain extent because it was the, the side of the tigris it was almost part of the green zone but as I came down to the roundabout, we like swung a left. There was a massive car bomb about 150 metres in front of us. It actually cracked one of our armoured windows at the back. Um, and it went off big time. And it was a call sign that we'd been working with. And there was three cars. And they took out all three cars because they were driving quite close to each other. And uh, it killed everybody inside except for two lads that got out. So we bomb burst in, dropped our clients off. And I said, I'm going back to see if I can help them. So the expat that was with me didn't even come with me. He said, I, I ain't going out. So I took two locals with me who I said volunteers and two locals put their hand up because I had a good relationship with them. We bomb burst out there just to see if we could help, you know, help. Because I think the worst thing you find in, in that environment is that nobody comes to help you. When something goes wrong, you might have a transponder, but all you're doing is you're pressing a button for people to say, this is where it happened. Yeah. And the amount of teams that were completely wiped out it was absolutely ridiculous. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, shall I say for that, the two lads actually got out. They were very lucky and they got a, they nicked a local national car and they got out of there before the crowd started to come in. But um, situations like that were, were happening all over the country. You know, with the company that I worked for, I started a project where they pretty much, it was sub, subcontracted to us. And uh, I was told to lead the contract. And I said, this is what I need. I need four vehicles. I need all the, the tops of the four by fours cut out. I need like top mounted um, PKMs or GPMGs, um, X amount of am- ammunition, blah, 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 fully armored up vehicle, et cetera. And we didn't get anything. We ended up with four vehicles of AKs and like the windows smashed out the back so that you can sit there in the back as best you can with like cushions around you with a PKM hanging out the back window. It's not, you know, it's not the way that you kind of go about kind of doing a professional job and it, it wouldn't work. So the three expats that I was working with, and we had about 12 or 13, I think it was, uh, with a translator, um, a local national team, uh, all the expats resigned and they went out and said, I'm, I'm not doing it. So it came to like D-Day and I kind of had to make a decision. I could propose before to say, look, this is what we need. I think we should delay it by a month. They said no. And, it, and I said, well, I'm not doing it. And luckily enough for me, I made the right decision because the next day they sent a full separate local national team, not mine, out. And they lost about nine people and the rest of them got kidnapped. Um, and then that project then went, slept for about a month and then they sent a team out. Um, and then they sent another team out over a period of a month. Both those teams got hit and they lost 35 individuals in those teams. And they were convoy teams and they were, they were delivering um, kit to two camps 
up in the uh, Fallujah Ramadi area. Um, and it was just a complex attack. So we're talking front vehicle had two PKMs at the end of the road and they just fired straight through the windscreen. So they just killed the entire front car. Um, the second car, the driver got shot. One guy made it back from the third car to the second car. And he pressed uh, something that I'd instigated, actually, which was you press a button on the Thryer satellite, and it was there were car systems, and it would come through to the office. It was already live in the office, and he was speaking to it and saying he couldn't move because he'd been shot. And then somebody came to the side of the car because you could hear it, and luck, he survived. And there was only two expats out of four that survived, so they lost two expats, but they lost, I think, 13 and 15 local nationals in each of the contacts. So they were big contacts. They were very well rehearsed by the, lo the local militia that were carrying, carrying out these attacks. And so it was really important to make sure that you did training with your local national team to make sure you had the best available um, resources at hand, whether that was vehicles or weapons, and also that you can get out of contact with the drills that you've kind of been learned. So, Nick, how does it work then? If, so if an expat gets shot dead in, let's just say, in his vehicle or trying to return fire or something... What physically happens to his body then? I mean, from a, from a logistics point of view, does does it get desecrated by the by the by these um, militia? Does do, do the police come and take it away? Does it get does it get re, repatriated? So on uh, at the beginning, yeah, it was a bit of an unknown really, and that nothing really would happen. Uh, so just give an example, we kind of lost a like on one of those contacts. I think we lost seventeen people. Um, and the two expats, they made it out separately. One made it to Camp Fallujah um, and was turned away on the back gate because there was a wackies on the gate before the Americans. And they kept turning them away and he ended up having to go on foot and caught it like a, uh, he got into a car and said, I'll give you a thousand dollars. He made it back to Baghdad. And another guy made it back to a camp. We're talking after over two days. And between that time, they sent in some jets and they just blew the whole road up. Uh, on the other occasion there was uh, there was one of the guys that had made it to that footwell of the guy that had been shot uh, and this was all on 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 loudspeaker for us um and a dushka from one of the buildings up top and i think there's a film like clear and pleasant da danger there's a there's a clip in that and it was exactly the same as that because we know that because they they filmed it all and they put it on one of the websites online so that people like us could view it and then you know it, it kind of uh Put you on the back foot a little bit. That's what they used to do. They used to video most of the stuff and they would send it all to the, all the military camps to scare you as a scare tactic. So they videoed it and one of the guys, that guy that was there, he ran through, he got shot in the back of the leg, but he made it into a drainage ditch and he, he went into the little pipe. And when they videoed it, they, they took all our lads and they put them in there and they were still alive, most of them, and then they just drilled them all. And so the water went red. And then after about 40 minutes, he came out the drainage ditch because he could hear the tanks coming and he ran down the road and some American tanks and, and Humvees had turned up. Uh, they asked him if there was anybody else alive and he said no. Um, and uh, they just blew the whole road up. So we had like a guy called um, Eves and we had a guy called Sato Akito, who was an ex-firefighter. He was in the par uh, French parachute, um, one of the French parachute regiments. And he became a firefighter and, uh, and then he came to us and uh, the other guy that had survived had been with him and he got shot in a building. He kind of uh, kicked a back door open. He'd come off the road. He'd gone into a building. He'd gone through the building. He kicked this steel back door out and there was people on the roof there. So they kind of drilled him and he fell back onto his back, still alive. And the other guy then knelt down to him. He could see that he'd been shot about seven or eight times. So... He exited the building and he was one of the guys that actually made it to a camp like 40 miles away somewhere. But Seisho Kito died because they videoed him alive um, with his badges and CPA badge and all that, lot and our badging system that he had on his passport that he'd held on him, on his chest. But I think he, he died very quickly, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, they, the families were ringing up for quite an extended period of time and asking where their loved ones were and they were saying that they hadn't survived and they, they, they'd been kind of, uh, you know, taken out in, in the instant itself because uh, that's how it's done. Other, other situations that we found ourselves in where um, guys were uh, fatally wounded and we couldn't get them out because when you've got three or four cars and you're separated by about two or 300 metres and one of the cars gets wiped out, 
it's very difficult to get back in there. Now we did, and my teams were lucky enough not to have a fatality like that. Um, we we went in there and, and got people out and just like relied on our our training and our tactics that we were doing to go through set processes to bound them out to where there was a bear. And then we would cut across and then they would be a hundred meters away and we'd pull them into us. And luckily it worked, but on, on other situations, it didn't work like that because they were already dead or they couldn't move, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they were just left there. And then we send a local national team up about two or three days later to go and collect the bodies. What, what if the bodies weren't there? I mean, they leave, they'd leave them there. They always were left there, were they? Yeah, and on, 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 on some occasions, we had bongo trucks where we, we loaded up about 12 or 13 bodies on one occasion, and uh, they opened up all the checkpoints as we were coming out, like almost as a sign of respect, and they didn't attack, a, attack our lads or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's harsh, you know, and I, you know, it's the first time I've ever really spoken about anything of this, so I'm sorry if I'm kind of reeling off a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it was a harsh environment, and it was... Um, it was really, really, really hard for the local nationals because they lost three figures in 18 months when I was there for that company. And we lost double figures and expats. And when they came back, they would lay them down in the back of the bongos and the families would come and they would argue on which ones was their, their son or their family member because you couldn't make Edmund or town. Um, yeah. it, was, uh, it was a very money oriented uh, kind of um, job. Uh, there was always two or three deaths written into each of the contracts. Um, and believe it or not, you know, and, and, and the lads, the SF lads that had kind of got lifted at Basra, if you remember that. Yeah. Uh, it, it, yeah, we... Tell us a bit about it and then I'll feed back. Yeah, so I won't go into that too much because obviously, you know, what second up. But um, there was two lads that kind of got lifted there and uh, they did a great job, uh, the SF kind of uh, command. In, in, in acting very quickly before they were triggered to, to be sent to different locations because that's what they do to get you out when they yeah. kidnap you. Um, but for us, for the civilian PSD security type thing, it changed overnight because every single checkpoint in that, comp- in that country then just became massively hostile. And they uh, pretty much said that they, were, that they would... Um, kill all expats, they wanted a female expat specifically, and then we'd have to have a process of going through the checkpoints. And I, I goodness me, maybe a hundred times when I got to checkpoints, we would be engaged before we even got to the checkpoint and half the vehicles had gone, gone through the checkpoint. And so we would have to drive through checkpoints while, be, while being engaged under fire. You know, it was, it was just hell on earth, really. Um, as I say, we, we, my, my team was very lucky. We didn't we didn't. We had a lot of injuries, but we did. We only lost one person, unfortunately, in Alan Bar. But uh, yeah, that SF thing. I just was querying it because Colin McLaughlin was mm. detained, wasn't he, in Iraq? Yeah, I saw. The, I saw them in the. I didn't know them, but I saw them in the uh, in the bar that night actually. Uh, but I was sat. I was sat outside this like cafe thing in Basra camp near the enclave. It was called, and uh, there was a young lad there, and he was about seventeen and a half years of age. I went over and chatted to him because he just looked really, he didn't look very well. So I went and had a chat with him because there was only about six or seven of us there. And then I went over to one of his mates and I said, is he okay? He, he, he's acting really strange. And he said, oh, he was in that incident today. And they went down there as the support group, um, like walking behind the tanks and kind of slotting police officers and stuff like that, essentially, to, to go and do the, uh, the attack on the police station where, yeah. they were, where they had held these lads, I believe, before they got transferred to another safe house. And yeah, he, he'd, um, he sh- he'd shit himself in the cafeteria about an hour and a half before just through nerves. And then he'd come out and they were trying to encourage him to come out. You know, that really, you know, that's for a 17-year-old, he, he would have gone through basic training. Basic training, and then he finds himself in a war zone like that. You know, that's what he's been trained to do. But at the same time, um, yeah, you know, there wasn't, there didn't seem to be any support system or structure to like, you know, help people like that out. Mm-hmm. But for us, you know, the, the war changed that, that day. We, uh, we just came under attack. We were going through checkpoints and getting, uh, and getting hit through checkpoints. We would go through two specific checkpoints, and they were about a kilometre to two kilometres between each of the checkpoints. 
and they just increased the numbers on those checkpoints. So normally you have like four, five, six people on checkpoint. There was like about 15 or 16 people on one of the checkpoints at one point. And then they would hit us from both sides and they would hit us from both checkpoints as well because you, you could see where the rounds were in the front and the back and the sides of the vehicles. And then one day, of course, I went up there and uh, went through that first checkpoint and it was always on the interports and all that lot. And uh, they opened up a bit too early and he took with a, with a uh, GPMG, because they had GPMGs, they took the entire checkpoint out, which was about 16 blokes. Next day, we went up there because we had to, and there was like two young lads on the checkpoint. And then there was never any dramas in it after that. But pretty harsh environment, yeah. Josh, does the name Andy Bradsell mean anything to you? No, has he been on the internet? It kind of does, a little bit. Book, has he read a book? Uh, he, he, was read one, well, he was one of my mates in the Marines, and he... He worked for Olive Security and he got shot dead uh, in Mosul with another former, oh, really? ma- former Marine. They got they got ambushed by some militia and and uh, they were taking a client to a, a, like a fuel plantation, you know, a fuel factory processing unit or something, and and. Uh, Apparently, 18 pickup trucks just appeared out of nowhere full of armed fighters. And Andy, and I think the, the other chap's name was Chris. P. Yeah, I didn't do a lot of Mosul. I went up to Mosul, but I didn't do a lot. We had another we had other teams up Mosul. One of the teams that was up there, and it was Seb. Um, it was in the French Foreign Legion, so we had like about two or three different names, actually. But uh, he was a good guy. He was a big guy. And what he didn't know about convoys and the routes and stuff like that, he was just experience you say look i've got to take a convoy across here and he would say stay away from that bridge do this do that he unfortunately was up coming out of mosul uh, and he was working on a project with Oz- olive up there because olive did quite a bit up in mosul and he came out and he set up an ied with um, some gas canisters and it flipped his vehicle onto the roof and it slid down the road and <clears throat> was engulfed with flames and the lads were trying to get to the windows but all the lads were like tapping at the windows with all the rounds going off inside and they all burned to death, unfortunately. That was a real kind of harsh one for us because uh, those lads were all in that vehicle just happened to be that they were all experienced. And there was like three expats in there and, uh, and one local national. Um, and it wasn't far off. You know, it, it's almost in that environment, anything happens and it's just uncontrollable. You know, we had to like, they would hit us on the side of canals. We had a couple of weeks in where we'd have a canal on the left-hand side. We lost three vehicles going into that. We lost three people and three vehicles where they had hit us on one side with an ID so the vehicles would go into the canal and submerge. And uh, it was just another element that was, you know, you'd have to try and think around, you know, trying to, trying to do a spin on tactics of how to debrush from a vehicle that's sinking and you've got a couple of dead blokes or very injured blokes in it. It's just impossible when you're under attack. So especially on a linear type feature where you can't push back, you can only go left or right or, or forward when there's, when there's a force that's attacking you and potentially daisy chains of explosives down the road. So it was always thinking and always changing your own tactics to kind of like fit in, fit in with this. And then obviously you also had the, uh, the other military, like the Americans, for example. Now, a lot of the Americans I've worked with were amazing, but they're, a, they're an army, they're armies within armies. And others weren't so helpful. And um, we lost quite a few people on blue and blue instance and stuff like that. Um, I was very lucky myself, you know, I had a Cobra helicopter when uh, when we came over the top of a brow hill and we were just about to punch down and push a left into at the back of Camp Fallujah and go onto the military road a couple of Humvees ago. And so I said, all oh, Victor, stop, stop, or vehicles stop. And I ended up being right on this lip of a hill. So if anything had gone wrong, they would have just clocked. That's the trigger car up there. And um, it did as soon as the, the Humvee got to the... Uh, the, the the exit of the where the military road met the civilian road, it just went about 30, 30 meters in the air and killed, I think, two or three people inside. So eventually they kind of uh, the two Humvees were sorting that out and two Humvees came up with their 50 cows on me and they didn't fire. But then a Cobra helicopter just sat above me about like about 80 meters and it just pointed like an escalation of force, just went zzz, with his uh with the two guns on the front of the Cobra. And luckily for me, somebody crawled in this uh, this um, US Marine crawled in my left hand side because they couldn't see through the bulletproof glass because we were kind of saying look you know I'm an albino ginger flipping westerner you know <laughs> don't fire on us type of thing um, but on lots of instances 
we weren't allowed that kind of a softer approach as that probably was. They just opened up and they opened up on, on a few of our people. We think we lost uh, four people in the first two weeks after the invasion in November of 2003. We lost it just, just from a blue on blue because they were, they were young lads and they were coming out of training and they, they sat on the end of a 50 cal. And we're on our edit reports, it would say, we've got, we got the exchange of troops. We've got people coming in country and they're really nervous and trigger happy. We've got people that are leaving after nine months or 12 months or 18 months because they used to do long tours. They want some kills at the end of it and they're trigger happy as well. So it was, it was a very difficult one. Jeez. Let's finish off then, Nick, talking a bit about the SAS. What, what's the... Um, What's your feeling? I, I guess it's difficult for you to say because you're on one side of the one side of the um, scenario. I'm going to put to you, but I see this asked a lot. What do the regular SAS guys think of the two three SAS? It, 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 I, I mean, I'm guessing they just see it for what it is. It's their, it's, it's. A, no, I think I think it's changed a lot, actually. I'm hoping that it has as well. But certainly when I joined up, which was 2000, um, they didn't like 2-1 or 2-3. And, and I can appreciate why as well. Because right up to probably about the mid-90s, maybe a bit to the late 90s, 2-3 um, and 2-1 and SPSR selection have been very different. It was done over weekends. Uh, even I think Test Week was done over weekends. It was a lot different. Um, and there was a lot of old school when I joined up that probably weren't as professional as I would have liked in joining an SF unit. Now, you get those in every unit. You know, I've deployed with 2-2 on many occasions, and some of them mean, and when I was a team leader in Iraq and Afghanistan, I was a team leader with two X-2-2 two, two blokes in my teams, and some of them were very good, the majority of them were, and some of them weren't as good. And it was a little bit like that in 2 one, two, three, like you get everywhere. But what I found was, was that the expectations of 2-1 uh, and 2-3 were not in line with um, what 2-2 two, two wanted because the training was completely different. And so it was like two completely separate units and, and they would say, well, they're not as good as enough and, and they're not doing the type of training they weren't doing. It was absolutely right. But then over a short period of time, when it came to certain types of training, like contact drills or surveillance and reconnaissance and urban, urban OPs and uh, ambush tactics and a few, a few other bits and bobs, 2-3 and 2-1 were, were excelling at that. And, and in actual fact, we went and did like a joint operation and I took over from, uh, I took over specifically from this guy um, who I later on met actually, um, but I'll tell you about in a bit if you want. Um, he, uh, I took over from him in, in the middle of nowhere on, on, when we came off this chick and he was going on and we took over from a team of 2-2 and at the end of that, like I think nine months of like uh, uh, operations, two, the, two, the joint 2-2 and 2-3 and SBSR unit had a lot more success working with the CIA and Delta Force and all that lot on what we achieved over that nine month period than 2 2 did. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're any better or not any better for spe specific jobs, because that's what we were trained to do. Because what I found with the 2 1 or 2 3 guys, certainly after, like, say, the late 1990s, was the training came more in line with 2 2. I think it. While I was in, it changed from 3K an hour to 4K an hour of the hills and 3K an hour. Uh, this, I think the SEER course went from 12 hours up to 36 because that's certainly what I did. Uh, and there were certain elements of the course that weren't in line with 2-2, and that, that was absolutely fine because they were a different unit than, than what we were. But what we found was that the people that wanted to join 2-2 that came from 2-1 and 2-3 past like mid-90s, I would, I would probably guess at, uh, I think were great soldiers to go for that unit. And I think they've accepted that now a little bit more because when I was in, there was only two blokes that I knew of from those, these units, reserve units, that had gotten into 2-2. And one of them was uh, on, in Bravo 2-0, Chris Ryan. And the other guy was a guy that, that I knew from 2-1 from that had got in. But everybody else had a stand-up fail. And I thought it was just, just Sorry, Nick, just clarify for us then. So if you come up through the ranks... In two three, so as a as a, I don't even know what you, you does that make you a civilian or, or or. No, you're in the army, but you're kind of not like full time army. Although part, part, part time, yeah, 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 of course. I was there of service. And then, you can transfer to the, 
to the regs? Is that you can apply to join them? Yeah. And do you have to do full selection? Oh, you have to do full selection on top of what you've already done. Yeah. So when you when I joined HCR, I went from two three to HCR. I had to do a separate selection. It was devised by a bit of a legend that was in two two. I won't mention his name if you don't mind, but he was a. Uh, an inspirational character and kind of like helped me in my facilitate my move forward. And in actual fact, he was the one that approached me on a number of times and said, I want you to go for HR. I want you to go for this. And, and he would, and that's exactly what he did. Mm. But what we found was that everybody that from two, one and two, three, they were very capable SF soldiers, if you want to call them that. And when they went to two, two, they all got stunned up fails at the end. As if to say they weren't, um, they weren't right for that unit or whatever. But much later, the guy that devised HCR he had a look at that whole political kind of situation, I believe, because I'd left by that time in 2004 and said, look, this isn't good enough. These are, these are lads that essentially I have trained because I devised this unit called HCR and they're quality people. And you can take somebody that's been in the parachute regiment, left school, joins the parachute regiment, does like four or five years, becomes like a, a sergeant and then joins 2-2. He's an ex- probably an exceptional soldier and he's got the grit that it takes. But then when you're sat down with a warlord, and he's got his kids there or whatever, um, and you have to interact with somebody, sometimes, and I'm not saying all the times, but it's very helpful if you've got somebody that has those qualities and attributes and that hardiness and that ruggedness and the capability to pass an SF course, but at the same time has maybe run his own business uh, and maybe has a degree and maybe just has a little bit more experience to communicate with people. It's a good, it's a great thing to have. And I think they were, certainly when I was in, they were missing out on those people. And now I believe it's changed. It certainly changed, I think, certainly in the mid 2000s. And I would imagine it had changed quite a bit now. And they're starting to see the depth of these people, the fact that they're, they're SF soldiers that maybe not be trained to the, to the level of, of doing certain things like, you know, oxygen, they've been parachuting and stuff like that, and some of the black stuff that they do. And, uh, and I'm not, like I say, I'm out of the loop because I've been out since 2004. But certainly they're good quality SF soldiers for certain tasks. And they're, they're great candidates for 2-2 and the SBS selection. Mm. And since then, I think at one point for quite a few years, the uh, success rate of passing for those people was like about 100%, 90-100%. So it changed from nothing to, to 100%. And there's always been this 2-2 um, uh, 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 and 2-3 two, and 2-1, two, uh, two, but there, there wasn't as much of that was SBS and uh, SBSR. Because a lot of the guys that were HCR, um, which was the, the slightly increased tier, but they were SBSR, they went down and they got the grandfather's rule and now they're in SB. There's been a couple that are killed, unfortunately, but uh, so they kind of got the grandfather's rule and uh, jumped across to SB. Wow, yes. Gosh, did you know any of the Bravo 2-0 guys? Uh, no, I've met a couple of them just, you know, in like a... Not guest speaking, but the, the uh, I'm just trying to think which one it was now. One of the lads um, was my uh, QM when I was on selection, actually, and he was handing kit out to me. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of kind of, kind of quite nice and humbling, I suppose, to a certain extent. Yeah. yeah. And what's it like to fire the M16 then? Yeah, it's a great weapon. I was really lucky. I kind of. Uh, I, I didn't do the SLR. I came into the military when uh, the SA-80 had come in. I think it was the first year, actually, so I was SA-80. And then I did the M16, which then kind of crosses over to, like, the, the Armalite kind of series, DeMarco, uh, with the 40 mil grenade launcher, if I remember rightly. So that was my personalised weapon. It was a great weapon. And, uh, you know, doing your night vision shooting and everything like that, when I deployed, we, on one occasion, we were our, our safe house in Afghan was getting hit, and we had a team of eight blokes there. Um, and at any one time, there was normally like four away. So it was a small team in one place. And they were trying to bracket us with these rockets. And so the warlords, we had a good relationship with them because we built up that relationship over a period of time and said, look, there's, there's like about 20 odd militia uh, down here, about 20 miles, uh, you know, if you want to go and have a look for them. So four of us went out there and we got, we got a confirmation from ops to say, yeah, yeah, go out there and have a look. And I, I remember thinking... I wasn't nervous at all. You know, there was nothing in it. It was kind of quite exciting, really, that I was given the opportunity to go and do my first kind of direct action kind of move into, into a location. Um, and luck, unfortunately, nothing came off it because uh, they'd already thinned out, but they'd set up a uh, daisy chain of rockets to go off at different times through the night. 
Um, and so we just kind of dismantled that and then and, and got rid of it, etc. And, and the lads already thinned out. But uh, mm. the capability that you have as an SF soldier at night, and uh, you know, even for, for me, because I did I did a lot less of the CQB type of stuff. We only did that if we found ourselves where we had to in going in and out of uh, built properties and buildings rather less than you know like the two two lads do like a, with hostage rescue and stuff we didn't do any of that we just did it so that we could go in and out of buildings safely and clear rooms and stuff like that um is is phenomenal and that weapon certainly brings something to the table because much later on i was then had a tarik then i had a uh, um a glock as pit side uh, side arms and we had like ak-47s mm -hmm. and um and 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 this, the weapon that's similar to the GPMG, which is the 7.62, which we have an AK-47, but it's longer uh, in the uh, in the, in the, the machine guns Kalashnikov range, and they weren't half as accurate, but different different as well. You know, the AK-47 you can put in a river for about 20 years, take it out, put a little bit of oil on it, move the working parts back and forth, and it will fire around. That's how good they are. Whereas the M16s are very good precision weapons. But you need to keep them clean, and you need to be on top of your admin with it. Yeah, I'd imagine the M16 fires similar to the SE80, does it not? They're the, the same sort of length, same ammunition. Um, I think it's a bit different. It just seems. I think it's that it, for me. I just felt that um, it was the difference between driving like a, a Skoda and a Porsche 911. Possibly, it just seemed. Yeah, no, no, no. I, get, I, I mean, obviously, it pro proved itself in Vietnam, whereas the SE80 hadn't really at that time yeah, proved yeah. itself anywhere, except that it had a lot of sort of. It was, uh, it was just a really uh, reliable weapon as long as you looked after it. Um, it was really accurate um, as long as you had it zeroed in and you knew your own zero in with with regards to changing. I think it used to be A cogs then, and then you change it over to a, like a night mm. um, a night vision. And it was so accurate. Um, it was a great, a great weapon. Yeah, really good. And then 40, 40 mil was a bit less accurate, um, to be fair, but it was a good piece of kit to have on your weapon anyway. Yeah, I think um, I, I was lucky. I had both SA80 and SLR as my personal mm -hmm. weapons. And so SLR was on ship uh, along with a nine mil pistol. We, mm -hmm we had but i think everybody needs the experience of firing 7.62 long barrel to understand the difference between that sort of weapon mm. and and a 5.56 yeah the difference being one is just so incredibly accurate with such punching power from such distance that it's just an awesome mm. Sorry, you shouldn't talk about death in terms of being... No, no, but, but if you talk from, about the, the, yeah, the accuracy... From, from a, a purely a mechanical point of view, it's just an incredible weapon, the SLR. Mm. The SA-80, obviously, the lighter ammo, NATO standard ammo, share the ammo with the Americans. There was a lot of, you know, lighter to carry. There was a lot of other stuff outside of marksmanship that went with that weapon, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, when you're on the range or 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 in theatre, you you only need a bit of wind, and it's just a game changer because then you're having to guess where, how far to aim off, or yeah. or you know, I know, I know. That's, that's what we used to do in Iraq a little bit. We kind of you aim off with the AK-47s a little bit because you don't get chimes to zero your weapon all the time, and then so you'd see the fall of shot, and then you'd aim off from there a little bit from the dust. You know, I, I give you an example of when, uh, you know, the, the armoured vehicles that we had, the, the, the 7.62, uh, the AK-47 rounds would go through it and uh, sometimes. And we were, I was in an incident where, I won't mention the name of it, but we went into a location which was one road in, one road out. And it happened to be about six, I think five or six kilometres out, there's a big mountain area and there was a tank on there with about four Humvees and they were obviously working a predator uh, from there as well, drone. And um, we went into this location. We'd already been to a few, and uh, we'd had a, we'd come unstuck by a couple of ambushes and incidents. And we wheels um, came off of a car, and when we were trying to sort that out and burn it and get it off the road, we got attacked, and, and we ended up all culminated to this thing where we went into um, this place, and we had four cars, and left the the, uh, the local national car outside the city gates, as it were. It was only one road in, sort of like a, a town almost, really. 
And when we went in there, they chicaned it. And the militia had taken over the, this police station, if you want to call it that. And uh, they took our first car. And we were kind of about 50 metres back between us. And a bloke called Brett, who's ex-commando, uh, actually, was in the car in front of me. And he got out. And he was lucky enough to get back in this car because I was kind of shouting down the radio control, um, get back in the car. And we turned our vehicles around. And as we did, they'd already reorged and they'd come in two massive pickups and PKMs on, on the back welded on the back on a tripod um they just shot straight out in front of us and so i came up on the radio as i was moving forward because he'd kind of gone onto the central reservation a little bit and he he didn't give me enough room and i was driving this vehicle and it was an up armored vehicle and four blokes were in that and as i came on the radio because i thought i've got to go because they're going to just mow us down here uh, I could see Brett and he was airborne and he'd hit this centre of elevation in a normal kind of XRUC car, smiling actually, they were. He'd hit this centre of reservation. He was like flying through the air and you could see the power of the rounds hitting him. And as I kind of moved forward, I just touched the, their vehicle to knock it out of the way. And it, it, didn't, it wasn't in gear or anything. So it just moved just about a foot and it allowed me to scrape through. But by the time, from the time that I started to move to the time that I hit the vehicle, it was only about four, three or four metres away, four blokes jumped off and they just opened up. And I remember looking to my right and there was a guy stood here and he just pointed the AK-47 straight at my head and he unloaded a full mag, 30 rounds, into that window. They were only supposed to take five or six because uh, he went down and they had, he was, I remember thinking he's, he's well trained because he flipped the empty mag in the back of his foot, in the back of his leg for some reason, even though it was empty. And then he pulled another one out, banged it on there. And they drilled the petrol tank, the engine, and all four wheels and all of the windows. So when we got going, I couldn't get the speed up on the car. We were already on the one flats. And they chased us down. And all the, all the electrics went off on the car. And I had two clients in the back of the car. They were proper shitting themselves. Uh, all the electrics went off a couple of times. And uh, I said, we're doing a cross deck. We're doing a cross deck to Brett that was behind us. And then we picked the local national vehicle. It was a soft skin completely. And the PKMs were raining down on us. And you could feel them. They were coming through the cars, but they weren't hitting anybody at that point. And, um, and he'd go, you can't stop. We can't cross deck because they're chasing us. And all the lights would miraculously come back on if it's like a gift from God. And I'd bang it into third, jump start it, and we'd be off again. And then they stopped chasing us because we came into sight where that tank was. And the car had caught fire at this point and you couldn't, I couldn't see anything. So I went to, I went to cross deck and as I, cause I couldn't see anything. We were, I piled straight into this ditch so that everybody uh, that was in the back of the car kind of shot forward and like head the back of the seat. Uh, and we cross decked into the uh, wet car and I got the clients in there and the client, when we got cross decked in, I said, cause we've got our good drills and you have everything on your lap. If you're going to cross deck, you leave absolutely everything. And he went, like, as he got into the car, and we were just about to go, and I was just about to get in myself and make sure I pulled the radio out. Um, he said, we need to go back into the boot and get a black bag that's in there. And I went, no, we're leaving everything. And he went, it's got, it's got a computer in there with all our future locations on. <laughs> so I popped the boot, like we were still under fire from about a K-way, because by this time they were staying out of the way of the tank, but firing from a distance. So it wasn't as bad. Um, I was just launching all this kit out until I got this bag, showed it to the client, lobbed it in and we were off. And we went and laid up actually um, about two or three hundred metres away so the tank can see us. And they sent a drone out and you could hear it above, above us like a predator. And uh, they, put, they put a ring around us of uh, 50 cal from, from the, one of the Humvees, I suppose. As if to say, do one, get away from here because we don't know who you are like. And then we had to go all the way down to Camp Fluja again, because Camp Fluja was like a, a safe house, if you can call it that, to actually kind of evade, evade not just the Americans, but the militia as well. But the, uh, the, the, the rounds, that the, the, uh, although they weren't um, high-velocity rounds on the AK-47, they would still go through the armour that we had on some of our vehicles. Yeah, I've never worked that out, because um, I got shot at twice in the Marines, and the first time was an AK-47. And um, they hit the guy behind me. And he survived. 
it hit his aniba jacket so it hit his flat jacket it didn't it didn't hit the plate it just hit the jacket itself like the yeah. fiberglass wadding but they said because it was a short round yeah. um it it bounced off and actually the round ended up in the top pocket of his parasmock <laughs> yeah, but he's got that round his neck now yeah yeah, but and the next day he had a massive. I've got a photo of it. Massive bruise. Um, yeah, it's a they're, they're big slugs. They're big yeah. slugs. The, the the lads that kind of got um, got hit by his five point five six high velocity. They'd normally find they just stood there, and uh, you know we had a, quite a few incidents with blue on blues, as I say, and we kind of uh, they got, they all survived. They did, uh, but I'd even approach other teams where we went out to assist, and they'd been shot, and it was. Um, on initial inspection, it was like a, a biggish hole at the back where it exit, and you could almost not see it. It was just straight through. But with the with the seven point six two, and we found this when we were firing into targets and stuff like that, even at short range, because of the uh, the lack of precision for that weapon, and also the the bad quality of rounds, they would sometimes spin the rounds. Hence, it would make it it wouldn't make it very accurate. But when they hit some of the lads just nasty they would they would get shot in say the chest area it'd come out somewhere completely different one of them had like a round that hit him in the middle section it came out of the bottom of his leg you know it was because they would tumble in the air a little bit yeah. we found that we found that a great deal when we were kind of uh, practicing rounds because you'd look at the targets and they would it would be longer rather than just a hole yeah. that's just bad rounds that isn't weapons yeah, when Jock got hit, they they was reckon it was a seven point six two short round as opposed to a long one, and that the short had had less punching power. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's an AK forty seven, yeah, rather than a PKM. Yeah, yeah which is good, you know, because if you get hit by a PKM round, flip me, it's, it's devastating. It'll be completely different because, yeah, yeah, mm. quite funny, really. I was the guy. In, I was in front of Jock. He was behind me. And after the guy had hit Jock, hit, actually hit him three times. Took one, one round went through his weapon sling. One took the antenna off his uh, electronic equipment. And the other one, like I say, slammed into him. And then, then the, the I, I call it a sniper, but obviously with an AK, it wasn't a sniper in that sense. But gunman, yeah. let's say. Then he turned his sights on me and the rounds were popping up like you see in the you know the, yeah 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 I'm just Stuff. these yeah. little greeny brown geezers kicking up like this yeah yeah and um yeah, worrying, isn't it? yeah I can't remember what I was going to say um so you got shot three times mm. yeah oh no that was it that was a funny thing but then someone someone messaged me and said um no, 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 what it was, it was this unit at this location, right? It, it, it's talking about the, the same contact, it's, you know, and it was, it, and, and he get, and he, because I called a guy Jock, because obviously in my memoirs, I give everyone a pseudonym. And it was the same guy, because he called him by the real name. And then so and so did, and I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I wasn't the guy like stood next to him. Yeah. Or, five meters away from him then all right <laughs> I say, it's unusual you know we used to get blokes that would be in massive instance and, and including me and we'd write our well, of course and i would misread their reports and think what contact were you in no it's a contact it's harsh we've lost blokes we've lost cars yeah. and we've lost this or whatever you know we've gone to assist another a team that have lost blokes and lost cars and and then we've been involved in it a little bit and everybody's writing their reports and you kind of read some of the reports and go you know what you don't need to exaggerate stuff like that. It's harsh enough as it is, you know. People are very unusual in the way that they kind of like uh, did stuff like that. Yeah, but it's strange enough if you're talking about a sniper, another dip. There's, there's hundreds, mate, honestly, and I, I, I could bore you all for a week with it. But uh, I was uh, I was looking after Julian Mannion and uh, Mark Austin at one point for about three, four months, and they were in the green zone. And uh, I happened to be at this point just living in the red zone for a period of this. I ended up going in the green zone for a couple of months so that I could be close to them and manage them. But... At this time, they were in one of the, I can't remember what the hotel was called now, but it was like where all the news presenters were, which was in the green zone. And one of uh, Julie Mannion's, um, uh, like, camera people or whatever, had eaten some hummus or something like that. And we got a call saying that he'd got anaphylactic shock and that he hadn't got his pyroton with him. So I was asked, could you go and take his pyroton? Now, when you ask a question like that, we were about a mile out of the, 
out of the green zone in the red zone. Now, that, a lot can happen in that mile. And, you know, I don't, that's if anything that people can take from this, then it's that. It's just a completely harsh environment and you're being hunted all the time. And we were just, our local checkpoint or the checkpoint that was nearest to us was checkpoint 12. And it had a flyover over it. And that checkpoint had been wiped out probably three times and they'd been rebuilt, etc. And that was the checkpoint that you exited up Route Irish to the airport, which was renowned as the worst road in the world. I think it was 2.3 kilometres long. But we certainly lost about four or five people on that road. And there was, at one point, about two or three people on that that died a day. It was absolutely ridiculous. And they used to sell mugs that said, I survived Route Irish. Anyway, I drove into the checkpoint. I got drove into the checkpoint, smagged myself up and all that. I got just got a shitty low profile car, and on me, I drove to the checkpoint, got to checkpoint twelve, give him his pirate on, which it didn't even look like he needed. And then, when on my way out, I came out the checkpoint, and they have to raise the last barrier to let you out. And as I approached that barrier and I stopped, I looked to my left, and there's a couple of marines there, and there's a couple of marines back there, and some local nationals a little bit further down. And somebody takes a pot shot at me, a sniper, and it hits the corner of my window, right at the back of my head. And um, I obviously flip and react to lose my hearing straight away because it, it's so loud when it, it enters the vehicle with the pressure change, I couldn't hear anything. And I look left and the, the two US soldiers think that it's me that's done something in my car. So they kind of aim their weapons at me and I just put my hands up and went as if say, you know, and I pointed down the road because they, there was talk of a, a sniper had done it a couple of times at the end of the, the steel that they put on this flyover right at the end of it i think he used to lay up there and um, when you looked at the round going in i think it was down there somewhere but uh, they just raised the barrier uh with the electric button and um yeah and i was off so that was kind of like a nice sniper attack kind of yeah survival yes. story. it's funny that uh, while we were talking i just remembered my this is my fo photo album from northern ireland mm. and uh I didn't think I still had this, but that this is the better cover his name up. That, that's the uh, con contact report. Hmm. Um, I, think I just was wondering if I had that. Oh, there we go. That, that. So this, folks, for friends, um, this is what it looks like when you get smacked in the chest by an AK round uh, and you've got a flat jacket on. You can see that. Yeah. See the bruise. It's your heart, can't it? Yeah. Yeah. See the bruise. The job Jock had made his bed that day. Nothing all smart there. I was uh, I was kind of like, uh, I changed my role for a very short period of time. I went into like as a training officer because they were quite impressed with the fact that we had an idea death in our team and we were getting out of big situations and stuff like that. Um, big contacts and ambushes and just the way that we deployed our cars and our low profile stance was a bit slick, I think. And so I was then put into a position which was train officer and down, I was based down in uh, Basra. I only did it for about four or five weeks because I found it painful with the types of people that were coming in. Not that there was anything wrong with like ex-bouncers and stuff like that and meatheads that go to the gym, but they had no military experience at all. And they were, I was finding myself trying to teach these people and they were a little bit gung-ho and I just... I found it impossible, so I ended up going back on the teams in actual fact. But um, I think we, it must we, be it must be a nightmare working with military people in that scenario. Because let's yeah. be honest, there's a lot of real crap ones, aren't there? There are, yeah. There was people that just seemed to, you know, I I worked on convoys at one point, and we'd leave about two or three in the morning to hit a, a little bit of dark hours to get through certain places in the dark, um, and I'd go up. We had like, we had a checkpoint here, then the enclave, Basra camp, and we were between that in another camp. And they'd walk up and get pissed in the bar. And uh, some of them would come back and I'd find them in the ditches and I'd have to go and wake them up and, we, and say, you want to job in one hour. And I used to, you know, I, it, it changed after that a little bit because I had a bit more authority. And I, eventually I would kick blokes out of country and say, no drink. You just don't drink. You don't do X. You don't do Y, Z. But at the beginning, it wasn't like that. They were just throwing people at it. Was it was it hard? Because as a civilian, 
were they respecting your rank, as it were, or your position as a, as a leader, or were they challenging you all the time? No, it was difficult at the beginning because uh, it wasn't until much later where we proved ourselves as a team. You know, my team was like cemented. We'd been through a number of big ambushes. Uh, unfortunately, there was like about two or three huge incidents uh, that happened in the country. And I happened to be involved in all of them. One of them was down in the Jaff. It was the biggest. Um, they reckon it was the biggest loss of life since the end of the war um, or part, you know, during the war. Uh, and the uh, the Americans um, took down about, I think, about 1,800, 2,000 militia. And there were about 4,500 of them. The rest of them they captured. Uh, it was a huge thing. And they all came from, I think you must remember it on the news, where they took Fallujah, they took Sada City. Um, where did all those people go? They went down into a field that was opposite a location that I was at, and there's only three expats there. And it was just fluke that it happened the way it did. They shot down an Apache that went over the top of us and landed about 90 metres away and killed the two pilots. And then it just, it just, the storm started from there and it went on for about 24 hours. And we had A-10s coming in. We would have to get out of our towers because we had four towers, watchtowers. We'd have to get out of there. Some bloke on Skype would tell us from like uh, Scania, I think it was, and say, get out your towers. We've got a, a thousand pound J dam coming in and F-16 would drop a J dam. And then all night, Spectre gunships just mallet it. And so you had that incident there and, and a few other kind of very big incidents that we were involved in. And I think over a period of probably about a year and a half, two years, you just build up a, a bit of a, um, a thing where maybe, you know, you're professional and I think you, you stick to your guns, you're, you're reliable. Um, and that goes a long way. And, and also the companies screwed the nut as well, because at the very beginning, it was a numbers game. They were just getting blokes out there. But eventually they started to get better blokes. Some of the blokes were leaving the military. Some blokes were leaving the commandos and the parachute regiment, or even the basic army and coming in. And, uh, and, and they just had the basic fundamentals that you needed uh, from a soldier or whatever. And even in abroad, we had lots of Russians working for us. And we had lots of French and Germans and Danish lads. And they were brilliant. They were really, really good. Uh, yeah, some of them were, were not as good, you know, getting pissed and taking a pin out of a grenade and passing it around a room and all this kind of sketch. It was, it was a bit crazy at the beginning, but we started to thin all those people out. And then eventually we had about six teams of two expats that were all very good quality people. And it was very unfortunate that we just lost in the 18 month period, we lost 17 of 17 expats that were then replaced and replaced and replaced. So, so it ended up being that after that 18 months, two years that I worked for that one company, when I then left and went to another company, which was a bit of a, a bit of a safer job. Um, yeah, we'd gone through quite a lot of expats and there's probably only one or two of us that were left from the very beginning, 2003 to 2004, because everybody else had uh, yeah, lost their life, unfortunately. Jeez. Well, on that happy uh, note, Nick, I'm going to bid you farewell. It's been absolutely um, eye-opening. Thank you for the invitation, mate. It's great. Um, it's great to read all your podcasts. I, lo I love what you do, mate. It's, uh, it's good to kind of link up with you. So thank you. Oh, you're more than welcome. Are you, are you, uh, how have you survived mentally through all this? Because you've been through a lot. I am, um, strange enough, I was on this conversation just this morning with, with somebody, somebody else completely different, but um, about the same kind of thing. I, uh, I, I happened to link up with two or three people that I ended up getting very uh, close to that I worked in the Middle East with. And, uh, and they all, all three of them came to my wedding, in fact, and, uh, and I thanked them there because fundamentally, that's what I needed as an individual was actually sitting down and not speaking to a counsellor or a psychotherapist or my doctor or whatever. It was actually just sitting down with uh, like-minded people that, that were, had gone through something very similar mm. and that kind of knew I was feeling and knew that I probably, I had to go through the process of talking about it at the beginning, probably once a week and then about once a month and then once every six months or a year. And I think it's not for everybody, um, but I think I've managed it quite well. Um, I think I'll always um, be able to get relatively emotional or upset about some of the incidents that I was in and or where we were essentially assisted and, and lost people and stuff like that. Um, and I don't mind that because it's part of my life now. It's kind of, a, in a sense, it's kind of remembering those, those lads and, and stuff like that. And at the same time, you can't draw a line through it and go, okay, it's boxed away. And I think I've, I've, I've learned to box things away as best I can. Yeah. Um, and I use it to, to, 
to uh, to move forward in my life. I think that everything's about perspective. I love my life. I love my family to bits. Um, I, I've got some great people within Elite Outdoor Fitness that have now kind of uh, I become really friendly with. And, um, and I think it's about taking things that have been in your past um, to allow you to have a different perspective on life because I think it's really important yeah. because most people don't do that. And, and I think that this isn't me. This is me talking. I, this is what I do in my life. But some people have, have had amazing lives. They've, they've had addictions. They've gone through alcoholism or, or drug addiction or you know, um, violence in their family or when they were being brought up. You can almost switch those around and use them to your advantage to have a better perception of life and help other people kind of have a bit more, uh, a better kind of understanding of balance and how you can use all those things that have happened in life to kind of build that resilience and um, become a better kind of person for it. And hopefully I've done that. Yeah, well, you certainly have, mate. All credit to you. Um, for our friends at home, if any of you out there need a nudge with your fitness, some support, help you get into it the easy way, whatever it might be, or maybe you're aspiring special forces, then Nick is your man. We'll put a link below. So um, action creates action. For action creates a perfect life. So uh, if there ever is such a thing as a perfect life, it certainly helps you get the life that you deserve. So um, get in contact with Nick. And uh, Nick, stay on the line so I can thank you properly. But yeah, no, no massive problem. thank you for sharing your uh, life with us. Appreciate it. It's, um, gosh, it's uh, some real serious stuff you've let, let us be privy to that there. So thank you ever so much. My pleasure. And um, to our friends at home, big love to, to you all, as always. Please like and subscribe. Please share. Could you put a note in the comments who you'd like to see on the show? That'll be great. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.